فات محمد الوسيلة والقوي وبعد مقام المحمود الجليلة Good day and assalamualaikum. I am Dr. Ahmad Zuri from the School of Electrical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, UTM, University of Technology, Malaysia. Welcome to our distinguished lecture series organized by the Faculty of Engineering, uh, UTM. This is our 52nd lecture since we started the program in June 2020. Today, we are honored to have with us Professor Karim Abed Marain, who is affiliated with University of Lyon, France. The topic of his lecture is blind source separation from basic concept to new challenges, uh, which is basically related to the area of research that I'm doing right now. Uh, Without further delay, I would like to hand over this session to the Dean, Faculty of Engineering, Professor Dato Engineer, Dr. Muhammad Rafiq bin Dato Abdul Kadir. Over to you, Dato. Thank you, Prof. Ahmad Zuri, for chairing the session. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hello, welcome everyone to our 52nd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Muhammad Rafiq and I'm the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Karim Abid Marain from University of Orléans, France. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Karim Abid Marain received a state engineering degree from École Polytechnique Paris, France in 1990 the State Engineering Degree from Telcom Paris, ENST, in 1992, the MSc Degree from Paris 11 University, Orsay, France, in 1992, and the PhD Degree from ENST in 1995, in all in the field of signal processing and communications. From 1995 to 1998, he was a research staff member with the Electrical Engineering Department, University of Melbourne, where he was involved in several research projects related to blind system identification for wireless communications, blind source separation, and array processing for communications. From 1998 to 2012, he was an assistant professor and then an associate professor with the Signal and Image Processing Department, Telecom Paris. In, 20, Telecom Paris. in 2012, he joined the PRISM Laboratory, University of Orléans, France, as a full professor. Dr. Abed Marain was a visiting scholar with the Center of Wireless Communications, National University of Singapore in 1999, with the Electrical Engineering Department, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore in 2001, with the Telcom Malaysia Research and Development Center in 2004, with the School of Engineering and Mathematics, Edith Cohen University, Perth, Australia in 2004, with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, National University of Singapore in 2006, with Sharjah University, UAE from 2008 to 2009, with the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in 2015, and with the King Pahat University of Petroleum and Minerals in 2015 and 2017. He has authored more than 400 scientific publications, including book chapters, international journal and conference papers, and patents. His research interests include statistical signal processing, system identification, blind source separation, adaptive filtering and tracking, array processing, and statistical performance analysis. So that is a biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Karim Abid Marim from University of Orléans, France, on the blind source separation from basic concepts to new challenges. Professor Karim Abid Marim, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Professor Ahmed, Mohammed Afiq, uh, Professor Sayed, and all organizers from UTM 
for giving me this opportunity to to present uh, uh, this topic about soul separation, a part of my work. Uh, so without further delay, so I will share the screen with you. Just one moment. Okay, there it is. So uh, as Professor Mohammed Afiq mentioned, it's about blind soul separation from basic concepts to new challenges. So this field, I have been working in this field, I would say over 25 years, and I'm still doing from time to time some uh, specific application or specific development in this uh, soul separation problem within the Prism laboratory. By the way, just a few words about my lab. <clears throat> in fact, it's a Prism, it's, it's, it's an institute, it's a pluridisciplinary institute, uh, which holds many engineering disciplines, ranging, I would say, from signal processing, image processing, contours, uh, combustion, aeronautics, materials, and so on. So it's a very large institute with very different area of research. So I have been with this lab for over now over eight years, and I'm still, as I said, working on blind source separation. So uh, in, that's the outline of my talk. So I, I made it I made it very simple for I thought of a broad audience. Uh, however, I'm open for any technical question at the end. If anyone has some specific or technical question about blind source separation, I would be happy to, 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 to give an answer and to give my point of view. But however, for this presentation, I skipped all technicalities, or most of them, I would say, and made it quite basic. So I will start very uh, basically, given the concepts, the basic ideas, and uh, I will highlight the application examples related to the source separation problem. Of course, source separation can be wider than independent compare analysis, but because of the, uh, the time limitation, so I will mostly focus on the ICA, which is independent compare analysis principles. What is the basic idea? Then say a few words about general source separation problems. And I will end up by giving some recent works, some new challenges before concluding this one. In fact, in fact if you, you if you consider a source separation problem, it is not a new problem. It's a very old problem. I would say it has four or five decades of research behind it, but it's still alive today. Still, you can, if you check the literature, you find a lot of people, a lot of research activity that's still going on around this blind source separation problem for some reason, because it's uh, genetic, because it has a lot of application, I will probably present some of them. And because all the time we still have some problems which are not well solved or unsolved, and we still all the time have new challenges that I will mention at the end of my presentation. Anyway, so, so what is the situation of interest? Uh, as the name mentioned, it is, uh, uh, we have several sources. That and we receive simultaneously these source signals, they are impinging on an array of sensors. And of course, because they are arriving at the same time, they are mixed together. They are mixed together. The simplest situation is that we have different M, as I mentioned here, M different linear combinations of N independent source signals that are observed at the same time at our recording system or array uh, of sensors that we are to have at, at hand and the basic situation can be modeled as follows so we have a vector of observation x represent the output of my array of sensors the m is m dimensional vector s represent the source signals it's n dimensional vector which is unknown and here matrix a represent the mixing matrix so these source signals are mixed together uh, and lead to the observation vector x. Of course, we always have some noise, some disturbance, which is represented by vector n. So that's the basic situation we can consider. And we assume that the mixing matrix A here is unknown, is unknown matrix. 
to uh, we are blind in the sense that we don't know the system, we don't know A, and we don't know the input signal S. So we have only uh, access to the observation X, and we have to process X in such a way we can access or retrieve the input signal S. So that's the basic situation. <clears throat> of course, this situation can be uh, can change uh, from situation or from context to context. In some contexts, we are lucky, I would say, and we have structured matrix. This matrix A is not any matrix. It depends on few parameters. The basic example of the, the, the most known example is when we have a calibrated array of sensors and this theta, which is uh, represents the angle of arrivals of different sources. So this is what we do when, whenever we have to deal with source localization or angle estimation of uh, source uh, signals. In that case, whenever we are in such situation, what I'm going to present, I would say, is, is not very interesting. In the sense, it's easier, it's better to estimate parameter theta and then invert the matrix A of theta hat, which is the estimated parameter, to get the input signal. So this uh, separation is easier, or most of the time it's better by doing a parametric estimation of A through its parameter theta. However, in uh, many cases, we lack of, because of many reasons, lack of array calibration, or we don't, we don't have, or we don't master the propagation model, or we have some disturbances, or whatever, in many situations, we cannot parameterize or represent A through few parameter theta. So, or even if we have such parameter, it is not reliable. So it is more robust to proceed in a blind way and estimate the mixture matrix of the sources by using, as I would say, as I will show later, some statistical information about the input. Okay, this situation uh, can, in fact, evolve from context to context. In some other contexts, we don't have this instantaneous mixture. We have convoluted mixtures. What does it mean? Does it, mean it means that the channel has multipath. So we have multipath channel. So we have memory in our system. And we don't have just S of T, but we have delayed, time delayed version of S of T. And we have this convoluted mo model which is slightly more complex than the previous one. So, because in that case, we have to handle simultaneously two problems, which is the inter-symbol interference conciliation and inter-user uh, uh, interference conciliation. So we have two different problems in one, uh, in, one, in, uh, in one MIMO problem, I would say, related to convolutive mixture uh, deconvolution. And in some other situation, we have, Another difficulty, which is the non-linearity. Of course, not all physical systems are linear. In communication, for example, in many optical communication systems have such non-linear devices. In satellite communication, we have this kind of non-linearity. And in some specific problems, we can face some non-linearities. Of course, non-linear models is, uh, can vary uh, in a broad range of uh, different models. One of them, just to mention one, is what we call the post nonlinear mixture model, in the sense that we have a mixture of different signals. Then these signals are affected by some nonlinearity because of some nonlinear device in our system. So these are different types of source separation problems. And uh, fortunately, I would say that the basic principle or the, uh, the basic ideas can be explained just with, by using this simple instantaneous li linear mixture. So I will ignore for the while all the other models and I will explain the basic principles and basic ideas by using this particular model, which is the simplest one that we can have. Anyway, so that's our model. So we have N sources, we have our linear mixture, these are our observation, and we have to do our processing, which name which we name a blind source separation, somehow to retrieve every single signal uh, at the output of this processing uh, device. 
So this problem uh, can have different objectives. So we can have as an objective what I call signal synthesis. Signal synthesis, I give a situation. Let's say you have two people talking at the same time, and we have an array of microphone recording these talks. So uh, in that situation, we would like to do the source separation in such a way we retrieve every single talk separate, to retrieve every input signal uh, and extract it from the mixture. So that's what we call signal synthesis. Okay, and we might have situation where we have as an objective a signal analysis objective. Signal analysis is uh, uh, is a kind of data mining. I would say it's a kind of data mining, in the sense that if we would like to explore the content or the, to interpret some complex signal, uh, one way to do it is to decompose it in simple element that might be independent, that might be sparse, that well, there are different possible decomposition, and try from this uh, simple elements to interpret the signal. The typical example is when we analyze biomedical signal. Biomedical signals are very complex, and uh, this signal analysis has been used a lot for such signals to interpret or to understand the content of this particular signal. Anyway, uh, also in the literature, uh, you, you can find some uh, close objective, but different objective, which is the PCA. The PCA objective is uh, fundamentally different from ICA, but relatively close. When, whenever you have a PCA objective or PCA uh, processing, what we do, we seek for directions, space directions in feature space, that best represent the data in the least squares. It is much easier than the ICA. ICA independent compound analysis objective is that we seek for directions in the feature space uh, which are uh, uh, most independent from one another. So we're, in the first case, we are seeking somehow to in high energy components which are orthogonal or decorrelated. In the second case, we are seeking for independent, statistically independent components. Oh, it's clearly it's not the same objective. Uh, the first one, we can do it just by using covariance and eigendecomposition. But the second one is more, uh, I would say, more complex and require some more advanced tool to achieve the ICA objective. OK, so that's overall the objectives of our problem. And uh, as any problem for engineer or for researcher, whenever we have a problem, I would say that one of the first tasks we have to do is to step back a little bit and to look at the problem and consider whether or study whether it's feasible or not. Can we uh, do the blind source separation by using only the observation? Can we estimate all the mixing matrix A, all the inputs, by only considering uh, the observation vector X and some, let's say, higher information on the source signal? The answer is quickly no. We can see that we can exchange between the Kyeth colon vector of A and the Kyeth entry or source signal, a scalar, okay? So the observation, by doing that, the observation X is unchanged, is unaffected. And so we can say that if we target source separation, we have to keep in mind that we can estimate the source signal up to a constant, alpha, and no constant. Of course, there is no inherent sorting of the sources. When you have two sources, what is source one or source two? It's the same, of course, just numbering. It's a random numbering. So you have also this permutation. So in general, when you have this particular problem, we have, before starting doing anything, we know that we have these ambiguities, which are diagonal factor. So every source signal can be estimated at best up to a scalar factor. And the sorting of the sources is random, OK? What is interesting is that these are mostly the only in ambiguities of our problem. So all the rest can be estimated. Of course, upon some mill assumption, I will explain just after, like the in statistical independence or the sparsity or other assumptions. And there are some mill assumptions 
These are the only two ambiguities of our blind source separation problem for instantaneous vision. Okay, so I will talk about how to approach or to solve this problem later on. But before that, I would like to mention some, uh, some applications. As I said, this, this field or this research field is driven by its application. It has a lot, a lot of application and every day, I would say we, every year, not to exaggerate, every year we discover new applications, new original applications. There are some of them that are very old, which is the cocktail party problem. I already mentioned, it's the situation where we have an array of microphones and many people talking at the same time, okay? And let's say I would like to hear or to listen to one particular speech, to one particular person, and remove all the others. In such case, I have to do this uh, signal extraction or blind source separation uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the retrieval of the desired source signal. I, I, I'm not talking about the, all the applications. I just I would, talk, I would like to, to mention one application that I, I, I worked in this application a few years ago within a project which is named the Homer Project. And in this application, <clears throat> It was with a company, which is Aldebaran company, which is now bought by some Japanese companies, some other. And the, the objective was to build a humanoid robot, a robot, a small robot that can help uh, people or the people in need, help people or uh, people with some specific diseases to, to do some task, open door or do some particular task at home. So to build this system, uh, of course, there are many parts. We, we were not involved in the, in, in the robotic, in the control, and different parts. We were involved only in the parts related to the hearing system of the robot. In fact, this robot doesn't have two, two ears, but 16 ears. 16 ears, which, which are represented here, which are uh, given by 16 microphones located this way around the head of the robot. So these microphones have two objectives. The first objective is to localize the speech. So when the master uh, asks the robot to do something, the robot should turn, so should localize the origin of the sound, should turn toward the, the, the master and uh, localize this the origin or the direction of arrival of the, the sound. That was the first objective. The second objective is source separation. Why we need source separation in that context? Because this robot has to be used at home. And at home, uh, you can imagine many other sound sources like the TV or the radio or uh, door ringing or some other people talking. Or So when you have different uh, sound uh, sources, uh, this uh, make the recognition system, speech recognition system, very difficult. This doesn't help the recognition system, and you understand that the robot has to understand what is said by his master. So to achieve this recognition system, speech recognition system, we need at first to separate the desired signal from all the other signals, and so we have to do blind source separation. So that was one of the application of line source separation uh, for this cocktail, I would say cocktail party program. So there are many others I will not mention because of time limitation related to cocktail party. I give another example I have seen in, uh, in one other project. It's, I would say it's a military project. And in this military project, it was anti-jamming. We, we built anti-jamming uh, receiver in a helicopter and if you look here it's uh, it's surprising that we they implemented successfully uh, one of our uh, uh, source separation problems which is a modified version of sobi it's one of our source separation algorithm which is sobi we modified a little bit and it was used successfully for this anti-jam receiver for military application Okay, so there is a lot of military application, I would say, handling this particular problem. 
whenever we have to get rid of, um, I would say, enemy or jam signals that are undesired and retrieve the desired uh, signal or the signal uh, of interest. So I give one example from different fields. So this a third example related to uh, industry. Industry. So this project was done with uh, with a company here, which is named EDF. It's electrical. It's power company in France. It's one the biggest company in France. And uh, you know, in France, we have a lot of uh, nuclear uh, reactors to generate this uh, power electricity and. Uh, and they have to uh, control and always uh, monitor the, the health, I would say, of these reactors. And for some physical reason, I would not explain here, that they have some uh, neutron sensors that are located around the reactors, and they would like to monitor some particular mode. This is in the frequency domain, I would say, this is the mode of interest. They would like to keep eye on this particular mode to uh, that give strong indication about the health of the, 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 the of, of the reactor. Unfortunately, the measurements the of uh, at the the neutron sensors is this ones. These are real life measurements. We have many different four sensors here. We have these measurements. And the desired signal is hidden here. So we cannot see it. It's, the desired signal is here. So what they did, they applied some source separation techniques. And they were able, from the different components, to extract the mode of interest, which is here. So you cannot, uh, maybe it's, uh, it was hidden before. This mode, if you will go back, uh, sorry, if you go back, it was hidden around this position. You cannot see it here. But by uh, doing source separation, one of the components was uh, the desired mode of fitness. Okay, so this just to illustrate one example from industry applications. One uh, another example is about uh, uh, image processing and SAR imaging in this context. So uh, you have, of course, depending on the uh, onboard system or your camera system, uh, you can have a resolution which is, let's say, relatively poor. It depends on the distance of the camera system. And for this recording, that was uh, different images of the same location taken at different time instant. But the region is the same. So this, this is the same region. And uh, uh, we applied source separation. Somehow, it's a kind of super resolution. Somehow, in one pixel, which represents a large region, one pixel represents a large region, we've, we zoom inside and we decompose the content of this region. So after source separation, these are the images obtained by applying ICA or SOBI algorithm to this particular image. So one last example, and uh, so this is another example about image separation. So you have a mixture of two images. By doing blind source separation, you can separate them. Uh, my last example is for another field of applications, is, which is biomedical application. There is a huge uh, literature uh, where we can find source separation applied to biomedical, to EEG, to EMG, to ECG, to different kinds of biomedical signals, because we have a mixture of different sources. You know, the, the human body is quite complex, so you have different sources. And we always need to extract some desired features or signals from undesired ones. So uh, this is quite old example, but it's quite illustrative example. This is uh, represent the EEG data at different microphones. We have different electrodes around the head. And these are the measurements recorded at these microphones. And in fact, what we did at that time, we just applied somehow blindly, blind separation algorithm, to see what is inside this EEG signal. So that's what we did. We applied different algorithms. This is JAD, which is one of the known algorithms. And we looked at the output of this blind separation. It's, it's, it's a kind of data mining, as I said earlier. And what we found that there are some interesting signals. The others are difficult to interpret. But this signal, for example, 
represent the move of the eye when reading a text from left, uh, from left to right. Then you come back to left, right, and so on. So this is the movement of the eye when reading a text. This one, for example, represents the blink of the eye. Okay, so you have different interpretation for different components. I remember that the other components for some of them were uh, well interpreted by some physicians in the hospital. They represent the, some nature related to the, to the brain activity. But the easiest one, I would say for me, <laughs> is this one, which is the move of the eye, and this one, which is the blink of the eye. Anyway, so the, the application, why I mentioned that, why I present that, is just to show that this is an de, uh, application-driven field. So there is a lot, a lot of applications. You can imagine many situations where we are interested in some signal. And unfortunately, this signal, when it's recorded or when it is transmitted, it is affected by many other interferences or undesired signals. Whatever uh, the situation uh, or the application is, if we consider this context, we have to get rid of these interferences by using different techniques and among them this blind switch operation. So we have application for airport surveillance, astronomical image separation, financial data, radio communication, and so on. So a lot of applications around this uh, topic. So let, let me uh, quickly uh, now talk about how to do it, how to approach uh, source separation. In, in fact, here I'm not talking about uh, blind source separation at large. I will talk about ICA, independent component analysis, which is uh, a large part of source separation. Not all source separation techniques rely on independence, but many of them. So for ICA, we use as I mentioned here, statistical approaches or statistical principles. And when we say statistical, it means that we use some statistics of our observation data. So if these statistics are of high order kind, okay, meaning high order, we use, I don't know, moments of order larger than two or cumulants of order larger than two or spectra, of order larger than two, whatever the order, we uh, we uh, we can do uh, we, uh, we can find enough information. I would say in the high order statistic to do the source separation. Upon one condition is that the source signals are non-Gaussian. Of course, you know everyone knows that for Gaussian sources, there is no high, uh, high high order information. Whenever you have Gaussian distribution, it is fully characterized by the first and second order statistics, the mean and the variance or the covariance is enough to characterize or to fully characterize Gaussian. So we need that the source signals to be non-Gaussian. We can afford one Gaussian source signal, but all the others should be non-Gaussian. And you can find a lot of approaches, solutions, I'm not going to describe them here, relying on this higher order committee. I would, I would, I would like to say that this is the largest class of methods related to blind source separation. There is another very important class, which is the class of blind source separation based on second order statistics. It is important, I would say it is even more important than the HOS based method, uh, because uh, when uh, it is simpler, I would say, it is simpler when estimating a covariance, it is cheaper and it is easier than estimating higher order statistics. Okay, so doing second order statistics is always simpler than high order statistics. So in terms of cost, most of the time it is cheaper. And not only cheaper, it is better. Why? Because let's say you have 100 samples. Of course, with 100 samples, you don't have the exact statistic. You will do some time averaging, <coughs> sorry. You do some time averaging, and let's say you estimate your variance or your covariance. And at the same time, with 100 samples, you estimate fourth order cumulants. The error, the order estimation error, roughly increases and increases a lot when the order of statistics is higher. So you have less errors by estimating a low order statistics as compared to a high order statistics. So it is in many cases when both solutions can be applied. 
In many cases, the second order statistics uh, is better than the higher order statistic based method. And the last class I would say is FLOM is the uh, fractional lower order moment. I would say it's low, low order statistic. I would say it's low order uh, as compared to two. two. Second order is two, low order is less than two. This is a small class of method which is mostly dedicated to the separation of impulsive signals. Let's say you have, for example, a typical example, let's say you have an impulsive noise, alpha stable noise, whatever. Whenever you have impulsive noise, uh, for example, for alpha stable, second order statistics does, do not exist. In fact, they go to infinity, the average diverge to infinity, and it is not reliable to use this high order statistics. It's much, much better to rely on uh, moments or fractional moments of order less than two. So this is a small class, but it's still important when you, whenever you have this kind of impulsive uh, signals at hand. Okay, so this is the different classes. Uh, what is the approach? What is the, I, I, again, I'm not going to give algorithm or details of algorithm because there are many. Even if I'm ready at the end to, to, to answer a question uh, or technical question, but I, I'm still giving the ideas, the general ideas. I would say a very and extremely important uh, principle is this one, is that what we call property restoral principle. So what is this property restoral principle? Uh, so the separation of the sources is achieved in general by restoring a strong property of the sources that is in general destroyed or lost by the mixture. And if we do the and mixture or the demixing of the signals, it is a result. I give an example. Let's say you have two sources that are independent, statistically independent. When you combine them, you have signals that are dependent, statistically dependent, because they both depend on the two sources. Okay? So you have the property that you consider is statistical independence. This statistical independence, which is a strong property, is lost or it is destroyed because of the mixture of these two sources. Now, if you do the N mixing and you restore separately the different sources, you end up with two components that are statistically independent or close to statistically independent. This is one way to do the source separation, which is the ICA, which is the basic idea of ICA. Of course, this restoring principle can be applied not only to statistical independence, it's not only ICA, but also to other properties. Again, sparsity is very important property. Let's say you have two sparse signals. If you mix them, you reduce, I, I'm not saying you lose the sparsity, but you reduce the level of sparsity. Now, if you try to apply a filter that in, in such a way that it, the output of this filter maximizes the sparsity, it has a maximum sparsity, it can be proved in some cases that by doing so, we retrieve the original signal. Okay? So it can be disjointness. For example, let's say you have sources that are disjoint in time frequency domain. By uh, retrieving or using this disjointness, restoring this disjointness, you can retrieve the original signal, and so on. So you have many different properties that you can consider to achieve the blind situation. This is very important. I would say this one, or this is the most important slide of my presentation. If you want to understand the basic idea of situation, it is the property restoral principle. Okay, so we try to restore a strong property of the signal. Then by doing that, in most cases, we prove that the restoration or the restoral of this property cannot be done unless we re retrieve the original source. I give one already one last example. For example, in communication, when you have uh, constant modulus signals, for example, if you mix two constant modulus signals, the result is not any more constant modulus. By doing the end mixing, you retrieve your original constant modulus, and so on. So uh, that's what we do. And I will mention just this statistical independence uh, property 
and how to apply the property restoration principle to statistical independence, which is basically the ICA. So I mentioned how to apply information theoretical principle for restoring the statistical independence. Okay, so here I have different sources which are statistically independent. They are mixed together. And we would like to apply a filter or matrix that is able to cancel A and to retrieve the source signal S. Of course, we don't have pilot, we don't have training. So what we retrieve here is the statistical independence, not the, 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 the exact value. So, so by retrieving the statistical independence, one measure, which is a, a classical measure, is the mutual information. Of course, mutual information is a criterion that measures how much information two sources or two signals share between them. If now I say that these two signals are statistically independent, how much information they share? Zero. They don't share information. So by minimizing the mutual information, if we go to zero, we retrieve two components or different components that, that are statistically independent, and we achieve the desired ICA. We can do it this way. We can do it by, I would say, um, it's an equivalent way. So there is a link between the different criteria by minimizing what we call the cool-back labor distance. What is this cool-back cool labor distance? It's a measure of our distance between different PDF, probability distribution factor. Let's say I consider the joint PDF of all my retrieved signals. If the retrieved signals are really statistically independent, this joint PDF should be written as the product of the marginal PDF of every component of S. So if we achieve independence, this probability should be equal to this probability and the distance would be zero, okay? So this measure has been used or with different, uh, I would say algorithm, simplification, formulation, and so on. Uh, and it is linked to this mutual information. Another measure, again, which is somehow linked to the two previous, which is the non-Gaussianity. The non-Gaussianity, let's assume that you have non-Gaussian sources, okay? Uh, whenever you mix them, uh, you, you don't become Gaussian. The, the result is not Gaussian, but I would say it's closer to Gaussian. What does it mean? We, we know that this Sontar limit theorem, that we, when we combine a large number of independent signals, the distribution converges to Gaussian based on this uh, Sontar limit theorem. So we get, so you have different sources. When you mix them, you combine them, you get closer to Gaussianity. So maximizing the Gaussianity is, is somehow to retrieve the original state of non-Gaussianity. How to do it is by maximizing the fourth order cumulant, because the fourth order cumulant of Gaussian signal is zero. By getting away from zero, by maximizing the, the, the amplitude or the magnitude of fourth order cumulants, we, uh, we, we maximize the distance from Gaussianity and we prove that this way we retrieve the original signal. So these are basically some of the uh, information theoretic principles that are used for ICA. Okay. Uh, now there are different algorithms, so I'm, I'm not presenting them as I said. If you rely on this uh, high order statistical or in this uh, maximum likelihood type uh, methods, you, can, you have mutual information, as I said, cool back method, maximum likelihood, and so on. You have a lot of methods relying on high order statistics. If we, you consider second order statistics, one of the well-known is SOBI and different version. Of course, SOBI has been uh, declined in, I would say, some uh, about five to 10 version, different version of this algorithm. Uh, Non-Gaussianity, maximizing non-Gaussianity, one known algorithm, the Jade algorithm, and some different version of it. And of course, you can use different information. So far, I just mentioned independence, but you can exploit cyclostationality. You can exploit finite alphabet for communication signal. As I mentioned earlier, you can exploit the constant modulus, etc. 
So there are other future or other strong properties that can be exploited to achieve the blind association. Okay. Okay. So let's. Uh, I, I didn't say much in purpose about the algorithm because it's, it takes time. I know it takes time. So just general uh, concepts and basic ideas about social passion. Uh, now, uh, why social passion is still active, I would say it's an active field, a very active field up to date. Uh, one reason I already mentioned, because there's a lot of application. It can be applied in many, many different fields. And as I said, every year we discover some new field of application. Every year we have some new application uh, fields, some new application, and most of them are successful applications uh, in industry, in uh, communication, and so on. But the other reason why uh, blind association is still alive, uh, because we have always, all the time, new challenges. Uh, one of the uh, new challenges is the nonlinear case. Nonlinear cases doesn't mean that there is nothing in the nonlinear. There are a few works about what we call the linear quadratic models, when you have some linear terms and some quadratic terms. You have some works about these post nonlinear models. But I would say that's it. So there is not much, if I compare the nonlinear blind source separation uh, context as compared to the linear one, I would say it's negligible amount of work in the literature. And I believe, I strongly believe, there is a lot to do in this particular. So that's why in uh, some places, for example, in France, we have a team, a strong team in Toulouse with uh, Yannick Deville and others working on this nonlinear model and applied to, uh, to, to, to radio astronomy problems, to some image processing problems and so on. So I, I just give here some sh short list. It's not exhaustive, of course, about some works, some old works, some more recent works about this source separation applied to quality. Okay, so this is one of the new challenging directions is to explore in deep the nonlinear cases for of blind suspicion. Another a new challenge, which which is becoming relatively old now, but it has lasted for the five, ten years, which is what we call the underdetermined mixture case. The underdetermined is the situation where you have more sources than sensors. So the number of sources is very large, and you have very few sensors. Let's say, for example, you have two microphones, and you have 10 people talking at the same time. You have 10 sources, and only two, two recording, two microphones. In that case, uh, we have what we call in the underdetermined mixture case. And for solving this case, we need some strong assumptions, which is fuzzy. I would say with far sparsity, haven't seen solutions that work well. So most solutions that are today that provide some satisfactory solution are all based on sparsity. sparsity. So this sparsity, that, that means that, uh, that your sources are not active all the time uh, everywhere. So it means that it, it might, they might be sparse in time in the sense that one source is active than the other, than the, the first source, and so on. So they are more or less uh, separated in time. They can be more or less separated in frequency. They can be more or less separated in time frequency domain, in wavelet transform domain, and so on. So you can, in general, sparsity means that we have a representation of our signal that is sparse. That is sparse that where we can find approximately the sources are different locations. They don't occupy all the space. So this is very important. And as I said, it has been an active field for maybe one decade, but we are still having some very challenging problems in that case. If let's say I just give an example, if you consider underdetermined convolutive mixtures, we don't have today nice solution. We might have some good solution for the instantaneous mixture, but not for the convolutive mixture. We still have to do some efforts, more efforts, to handle this convolutive and their determined mixture context. Okay, so this is just an example. This is a visual example in time frequency. For example, we have uh, different these FM signals, 
Uh, and uh, they are separated in the time frequency domain. So this visually you can see that the two sources, the three sources, do not occupy all the time frequency domain. If you, you combine them in the time frequency, you can see that you still have uh, some interferences here, cost terms, and you still have your, you can visualize your, uh, your three original sources. By doing some blind processing, you can find every single source available. So in this case, for example, we use sparsity as the main criteria for source available. Okay, so these are some references. I leave them for you in the slides. And uh, one uh, new and challenging uh, problem in source separation is where the sources are dependent. Remember, earlier I mentioned independent source separation. They are statistically, what I mentioned before, is sources that are statistically independent. But it occurs in some cases, of course, fortunately it's not all cases, but in some cases, it occurs that your sources are statistically dependent. There is a link, there is a statistical uh, dependency or correlation between your different sources. So uh, how to solve this dependent source separation is one uh, active field, currently active field. So of course we can use sparsity. Uh, some people have used the uh, bounded source separation, what they call bounded source separation, the boundedness of your sources or the fine alpha of your sources in some case. And uh, I, I have worked, for example, personally, I have worked with my students on uh, dependent sources uh, that uh, have some statistical model, which is autoregressive or AMA model. And by exploiting properly this statistical model, we are able to separate them. So thanks to this statistical modeling, even if they are statistically dependent, we exploit the AMA or the autoregressive information to uh, to separate okay some other people uh, use copula uh, in, uh, statistical copula functions to uh, or known statistical copula function for source separation and so on okay so these are again some reference in this field and uh, one last uh, challenging uh, problem in source separation is what i what i have named here is informed source separation so just as a joke, I said the blindness is over. We are not anymore blind. Somehow we have, we have the possibility or we, we have the availability of some information. This information can be obtained by some pre-posting. For example, I know some application in uh, musical signal separation where we do some pre-posting to the signal for us. Somehow we hide some information, this pre -posting. We hide some information in our speech signal in some uh, in in a, in a way that we can exploit this information to make the separation easier. Of course, we can rely on learning. So many people are talking about deep learning and this learning, uh, uh, machine learning, and so on. Why not? I would say if we have applications that can exploit the learning. Uh, I would say this is a plus, this is an additive value that we can exploit. I'll give an example about learning. For example, recently, I have been working on a particular problem where we have uh, at home, everyone at home has this uh, electric power meter that records the consumption of the different devices in your home, the oven, the fridge, the whatever, the TV, the and uh, uh, some uh, companies here were interested to, from this measurement, we have one sensor, to, uh, to uh, deduce how much consumption for each individual device at home, to, 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 to extract the different sources, which is the power consumption, of every single electrical power at home. So this is a very difficult problem. We tried a lot of things. Many approaches have been used, but the best solution up to date, and we have some product which are already in the market, are based on the on learning. Because in that situation, we have ability to learn about the conception of the oven, of the, of the fridge, or whatever device. Here. So based on the learning, the best, I would say, separation solution are uh, using learning techniques. 
Okay, of course, you can use pilots, prior information. Whenever we have some information, it would be, I would say, silly to ignore it. So we have to use and exploit this information at best to simplify the, uh, the source of data. Okay, so this again, I mentioned here, is uh, roughly a version of research. So I know that few people are actually saying this, but there's a lot, a lot to do in that direction. And uh, uh, it's, it's a source of, uh, of, uh, of a problem, a very interesting problem that can be uh, explored in the future. Anyway, these are some of the, the references uh, in that uh, particular direction. Uh, to conclude my presentation, uh, I provide a summary. So, uh, in general, blind association, and I would say blind processing, not only blind association, blind deconvolution, blind system identification. Whenever you hear blind, think about property restoral principle. This is very, very important. This is the key the key uh, approach for uh, blind processing, and in particular for blind association. Okay? Of course, blind association can be achieved by different methods. And for coherent sources, time correlated sources, it can be achieved by second order statistics. Uh, we can do the separation in time domain, we can do the separation frequency domain, time frequency domain, and so on. So I didn't provide and um, present the algorithm, but I just mentioned this that we can have for, uh, let's say, just decorrelation, you can have different approaches in different domains. The underdetermined source separation uh, has to rely on sparsity. This is very important. So we cannot handle the underdetermined case without really relying on signal sparsity, or, of course, using some side information, learning, for example. Uh, and at the end, I have presented some new and challenging, I would say, problems related to source separation, which for me represents some good opportunities for research and collaboration. And I will thank you for your attention. I'm ready for any question about this topic. Okay, so. okay thank you, Prof. Karim. Uh, let me see. Um, and look, ah, okay. Can you, there is a question here? Yes. Uh, uh, maybe I should read it out. Is it possible for? Let me see. I'll make it bigger. Okay. Is it possible for these signals to adapt itself with tasks performed in separating a group of source signal from a group of mixed signal? And what are the external disturbances that can affect the separation? So I, I do understand it. Let, let me try to understand first. Uh, Can you see the question? So oh. yeah, I do understand. Well. So they want ah, to, okay. to to separate uh, 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 a group, not individual signal, but a uh, group of signals. Is that is that the question? Performed in separating, so just to adapt itself, of performed in separating group of source signal. I know that, that there are some methods. Uh, that do not separate individual signals, but group of signals. So you can separate group of signals uh, in, in somehow in, in uh, not individually, but in in, uh, in bunch of signals. I give an example for EMG signal separation. EMG is electromyogram signals. So you have maybe in one fiber, you have maybe 500 uh, sources which are named uh, MOAPs, MOAP sources, we cannot easily separate 500 sources, which are very close. But what is possible is to separate them by group. So we can separate some group of signals that are in every, within every group, we have signals that are close to each other, statistically, or they look alike or whatever. So if it is the question, the answer is yes, we can adapt the method not to separate individual signals, but to separate group of signals. We can do also other things. For example, we can, we can not separate all the signals, but extract one signal. Let's say you have 10 signals, like speech signal, 10 speech signal, but I'm not interested in all 10 signals. I, I, I'm interested in one of them. So instead of doing the full source separation and getting all the 10 signals, there are methods of course, with some side information to 
target only the desired signal and extract it. In that case, we talk about signal extraction instead of signal separation or source separation. Okay, does it answer the question? I don't know, because it wasn't mm -hmm. clear. So if it is about group separation, yes, there are methods. We can adapt the methods or the algorithm to separate the signals by groups, by different groups. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, I, will, I will read it. Uh, good day, Prof. What algorithm or approach is suitable to be applied in image processing? Okay, for image processing, uh, I think some good approach, there are two good approaches. One is sparsity. Why sparsity? Because images, if you apply, of course, don't consider the image. If you apply just a gradient or Laplace transform to, to your image, what you get, you get just the edges. The edges are somehow uh, sparse. You can do it just in the space domain by applying transform, gradient or whatever, and you end up with a sparse signal, sparse representation. So sparsity is here. You can do a wavelet transform, and you go to the wavelet transform domain, and you have sparse signal. Okay, in the wavelet transform domain, this is what is used for compression, for example. You end up with a sparse representation. So sparsity, method based on sparsity, are very effective for image processing, for image observation. Method based on correlation, because you can imagine uh, neighboring pixels are correlated, are strongly correlated. So you, you have situations where you have uh, space correlation between your different pixels. And so methods relying on correlation, second, just second order correlation, also are quite powerful. And I have seen some works which combine both. They improve a little bit. So they can combine them in one, uh, I would say, composite criterion. One of them is sparsity and the other is decorrelation. Or I have seen some works where they do the processing in two stages. For example, let's say I use a sparsity to separate some signals. Then uh, on the result, I apply some decorrelation to refine the result, to improve the quality of my signal. So that's what can be uh, done for for uh, for for image uh, for image application. Okay. Yes. Um, question. Yeah. Ah, this is from our old friend. Yes. Azadin Baghdadi. Well, uh, he was uh, our uh, invited speaker previously. So uh, okay, let me just read this again. Uh, in the 1D case, the theory seems quite solid and the applications prove it. What about multidimensional signal? For example, what kind of hypothesis should be made? Wrong question here. To apply classical BSS techniques to the case of 2D or 3D image signal and how to manage the kind of signals in practice. Will it be enough to consider blocks of 1D vectors at the risk of breaking spatial correlation in 2D? which is very important in the case of image signal. Wrong okay. question. Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. So, in, fa in fact, for uh, uh, the main, I would say the main limitation uh, in the, for image application is not the way of processing. Of course, the way of processing has an impact, but uh, the main limitation is to find uh, the same source with different sensors, is to find situations so we have, in many cases, we have to do a pre-processing to retrieve this situation. Because if you look at the model, we assume that we have different sensors recording the same source. So for image, it's the same scene, for example, and the, exactly the same scene at different sensors, at different cameras. Usually when you have uh, uh, ca different cameras, they don't record the same scene. They don't. Of course, there is a recovery between the different scenes. So you have to go back to this situation by doing some pre-processing. Okay, so let's say this is done. So we have done some pre-processing and we end up with different mixtures of the same scenes. In that case, I agree with Asdin that uh, uh, most methods, uh, they just somehow generalize the 1D approach. The 1D, so they take the image, they vectorize it, they ignore this special way and they apply 
the same techniques uh, as for one disease. Uh, in recent years, maybe it has been done for maybe 10, 20 years, people have uh, started looking at tensors. tensors. And uh, now we have a lot of algorithm, fast algorithm and efficient algorithm for tensor decomposition. You can you cannot break the spatial structure and use different images as tensor and apply some directly keeping the, the, the spatial structure of your, your image, apply the source separation by doing some appropriate tensor decomposition. This is also possible. Does it answer your uh, the question? So tensor decomposition is one way to preserve the spatial structure of the image and do so separation. Okay, maybe this is the last question from uh, Prof. Uh, Azadin Baghdadi. Has the BSS community escaped the deep learning revolution? Yeah, in fact, we, we didn't escape. <laughs> in fact, it affects everyone. And I would say it's not bad. I, in fact, this is my point of view. Uh, learning or deep learning, whatever, deep machine learning, deep learning, whatever, is, uh, I would say, it's a complementary approach. So it, it doesn't work everywhere. In some cases, we don't have enough learning. We don't have data enough learning. The environment, the context change all the time. And the learning is not, I would say, is not possible. Doing deep learning uh, is not possible in some application. But in some other applications, especially the, the very difficult ones, it is interesting. And I mentioned already one, I, I mentioned two, two applications where the learning is very important. The first application I already mentioned is this, when we want to separate the power consumption from this uh, uh, power meter at, at home measurement, the power consumption of every single device at home. This very, very difficult problem. And with, as I said, there is few uh, PhD theses about this topic. They tie different signal processing approach. They, they tie some classification, different techniques. But the best approach and the ones that are already in the markets, we have already some devices that are, uh, that are developed and sold by some companies. Uh, they are all uh, based on learning. So they learn because the power metrics measurement, we have a lot of data, a huge amount of data, and we can afford to do the learning uh, based on this available data. And based on that, by doing appropriate learning, we have some good solutions. Say they're not perfect, of course, but we have some good solutions. Another example where the learning is really necessary is when you have, let's say you don't have many sensors, you have one sensor, you have one sensor and you have uh, different audio signals and you would like to separate them with only one sensor. It's very the extreme case of underdetermined. The best solution are based on uh, what we call uh, matched proceed and the dictionary. They use dictionary and this dictionary comes from learning. Of course, speech data is available. We have a lot of speech data and we can do appropriate learning to help the blind situation. In fact, learning for me is a tool, whenever it's available, that can help, that can be, be mixed, that can be alone uh, with the, I would say, the statistical approach we use so far for blind situation. Okay, that's it. So that's, I hope that answers the, the question. Okay, so um, um, there seems to be no more question, but Yes. I'd like to ask a question, maybe the last one. Yes. Um, okay. Um, uh, you see, uh, I, from your examples, I, I've seen some spectrum representation of signals. Yes. And I've seen some time frequency representation of signal. Means that uh, what method that you use to fit into your blind source separation depends on the characteristic of the signal. Yes. So, so you have to represent the signal accurately before start using uh, blind source separation. Am I making the right conclusion here? No, you, it's not to represent the signal accurately. Of course, it helps. If I can represent my signal accurately, it always helps. 
But what is the most important is that the, your basic assumption should be satisfied or more or less satisfied. Let's say you don't know the signature of your signal. Let's say I have a signal. I have no idea about the signal. But I use as basic assumption that these signals in the time frequency domain, they are separate. So I don't need to know what is the signature. But I need that my assumption that I'm using to achieve socialization to be valid, to a valid assumption. Up to a certain extent, of course, the, 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 the separation, the perfect separation never exists. But up to a certain extent, if this hypothesis is well satisfied, then the social separation works. Is, is it clear? So what is the most important is not the perfect modeling of my signal, but my hypothesis, my working hypothesis, would be a valid hypothesis. I can use or rely on this hypothesis to achieve life suspension. Okay, all right. So, is there any more question uh, from the uh, organizers? Let me see. Um, I just need to confirm, you know, <laughs> first. Um, if, uh, okay. Uh, well, we, we just have to wait for uh, Prof. Rafiq to uh, end the session. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, it's there already. Right. Right. Else I will start <laughs> making a conversation with uh, Karim. Okay. All right, Prof. Over okay. to you. Prof. Ahmad Zuri, thank you so much for moderating the session. And to Professor Karim Abed Muraim, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak at our UCM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, and uh, hopefully one day we will meet either in France or here in Malaysia, uh, perhaps after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. And uh, to all of you watching this UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so much for watching. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until then, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Assalamualaikum. Bye, everyone. Thanks, thanks for your attention. Okay.